for those that are welcoming you today's uh, webinar. This is a webinar series that's going to be conducted all week. And today's topic is the importance of electrical and mechanical reliability in electronic assemblies. My name is Robert Wallace. I'll be your host today and for the rest of the week. Um, I work directly for Alpha. I'm the regional marketing manager and channel partner manager for Alpha, and I cover the entire, Amer the entire Americas region. Um, HISCO and Alpha have had a very long association. As a matter of fact, HISCO has been in business for over 40 years. Uh, they have 34 stocking locations uh, in uh, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And as I said, we've had a very long and fruitful association. Alpha, we're the manufacturer of the materials, in this case, soldering materials or assembly materials. HISCO stocks those products and they supply it to our customers exactly when they need it, and they've been a, a huge help to us. When HISCO first approached us a few months back asking if we would like to co-sponsor this webinar series, we thought it would be a great idea. Certainly would add value to our customers. Uh, we we uh, basically decided upon topics that we thought were of, of interest to our customers, and so we were delighted to, uh, to partner with HISCO. Um, again, today is the importance of electrical and mechanical reliability. We have a full slate of other topics uh, that are scheduled through the week. And as a matter of fact, that, that schedule is on Tuesday, the elimination of wave solder, potential elimination of wave solder using solder preforms. On Wednesday, advanced driver assist systems, the road to autonomous driving and where alpha fits in. Um, on uh, Thursday, troubleshooting the SMT and wave solder process and also an introduction to ALPA's process checklist tool. And then on Friday, um, ALPA's Lumet uh, product portfolio of LED-related uh, products were for LED applications. Um, I would invite you to uh, visit the HISCO website. You can, set, you can sign up for any one of these upcoming webinars. We, we certainly would, uh, would love to have you. Um, I would remind you to look for an email also from HISCO after the conclusion of this webinar sometime this week. And in that, e that email, you'll find a link um, to uh, an ebook of related topics on today's subject of reliability. I think you'll find that, that very, very helpful. Um, just the ground rules, I would ask that you either mute uh, your, your uh, computer or your phone uh, so we don't have too much background information or, or uh, uh, there's no disruptions with background noise. The presentation will last about 45 minutes. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end of it. Um, but if you don't, uh, if you can't think of a question now, you think of a question later, on that email, you're going to be given uh, basically some contact information. Today's presenter is Jason Fullerton. He'll have his contact information as well as my email address as well. And certainly, if you think of a question later on, uh, please send us an email. We'll be happy to answer that for you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Jason Fullerton, who is our, our presenter today. Uh, Jason is with our customer tech service uh, support group. He's an uh, engineer, uh, been with us since 2013. He holds a bachelor's in manufacturing engineering from GMI Engineering and Management Institute, uh, now Kettering University. He's worked in the electronics industry and manufacturing operations uh, for automotive and high reliability assemblers uh, throughout his career. He's a member and past officer of the Philadelphia SMTA chapter. He's a Six Sigma black belt, ASQ certified uh, quality engineer, and a former master IPC trainer. He's published and has presented uh, numerous papers at uh, several, uh, at, at numerous IPC and SMTA meetings and functions. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to Jason Fullerton. All right, thank you very much, Robert. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the, uh, the first of this week-long series of uh, Alpha HISCO webinars. Uh, today's topic, we're going to discuss uh, electrical and mechanical reliability uh, with respect to solder and other related assembly materials. Uh, we're gonna attempt to have an agenda of about 20 minutes for the electrochemical reliability topic, and about 20 minutes for mechanical and thermomechanical reliability. Uh, we break these up primarily because there's different aspects of science involved in testing the reliability of both these types. Um, but in addition, this is also a pretty clean break from a material standpoint. 
uh, we tend to uh, think about electrochemical reliability and with respect to the flux materials that are present. So when we're testing fluxes, we're testing this reliability mechanism. Uh, when we're testing different alloys, we're testing more of the mechanical and thermomechanical reliability. So, for example, in the case of someone that wants to test the reliability of a solder paste, you know, both of these types of tests would necessarily be part of that testing scheme. Um, however, if someone wants to just change, say, liquid wave solder fluxes but keep the same alloy, you're going to have the same mechanical performance, but you do have different electrochemical performance when you go through a flux change. So that's the area you do want to focus your testing. All right, so, you know, one of our mission statements is to ensure that our customers have the best tools uh, that they need to build the, the highest reliability solder joints possible. Well, part of these tools is, is for example, this, uh, this webinar we're going to go through. We want to make sure our customers understand all the technology involved whenever possible, understand how we go about testing our materials, and then understand ways they can test their assemblies in conjunction with that to ensure that our customers, uh, you know, have the best opportunity to provide the maximum reliability for their customers' products. So when you talk about reliability, one discussion you have to have is, you know, how does it impact our customers? I mean, obviously it directly impacts the customers through any kind of field failures that would result in warranty claims and or user returns. Uh, although a lot of OEMs outsource their manufacturing nowadays, it's still their brand that's on the product, and in many cases it's still the OEM's uh, ultimate responsibility to take action or take responsibility for reliability of their product in the field. You know, to keep in mind and think about this in your everyday life, if you go and have a bad experience with a product or with a supplier, you're highly likely to tell their people about your bad experience. However, we go through every day and have good experiences with different uh, suppliers and different products in our lives, and we don't tell anybody about them. You know, this is true in our daily life, and it's really true on the commercial side as well. When someone has a bad experience with a commercial product or supplier, they're much more likely to spread that to other people that they uh, network with in the industry. So, you know, bad reliability can be much more dangerous than the relative benefits of good reliability are when it comes to the impact of small amounts of, of bad uh, product impact. So, you know, clearly our reputations are tied to the reliability of the products that we sell and put out into the field. So first we're going to cover some basics of electrical reliability. And when we talk about electrical or electrochemical reliability, it's really all about stopping the electrical activity of the fluxes. Uh, in the image on this slide, it's really about stopping what's called electrochemical migration uh, or more commonly known as dendritic growth. And you can see, clearly see the metal dendrite growing between the two uh, leads of these non-common uh, passive devices. Now, this is one type of electrochemical failure. It's not necessarily the only type. Uh, it's not always quite so pronounced. Uh, in fact, much more common nowadays with current designs and, uh, you know, current uh, electrical performance requirements, we're seeing a lot higher instances where leakage current by itself is sufficient to cause failure of certain electrical circuits. So it doesn't necessarily require quite the, uh, quite the obvious uh, condition here as the dendrite, but the way we test for both of those conditions are the same. You'll see that as we go through some of the test methods. So when we go about trying to determine the electrochemical reliability of a flux, we want to realize or understand how safe a flux chemistry or flux residue is. So there are a couple of uh, you know, industry standard tests. Uh, most common one you'll hear about from a materials characterization standpoint is going to be what we call SIR or surface insulation resistance. Uh, there's also electromigration or EM type of tests. Uh, those conditions are very similar to those that tend to spur dendritic growth. Uh, now those are great for general purpose testing, but in other high reliability sectors like automotive, we see more demanding tests because of the, uh, the enhanced stress the devices go through in their service environment. Some of the differences we see are, you know, longer test durations for automotive versus kind of a general purpose test. Um, we see the combination of conditions where the tests are no longer static, but they're now dynamic where you're changing temperature and humidity in conjunction with the service environment. Um, we see some testing where we're doing mixed cycle testing, where we do, uh, you know, bias temperature and humidity conditioned with vibration. So we're testing the combination of multiple factors at the same time. Um, and in addition, we're seeing much more challenging test coupons that reflect the much more challenging environment that the automotive products uh, tend to get released to. 
So first we're going to look at some standard tests, the SIR uh, test protocols. Now there are, are a couple of different standardization bodies that will release uh, SIR tests to material suppliers like Alpha. Um, so the first one I think everyone on this call should probably be familiar with is the IPC or J standard SIR testing. Uh, the J standard 004A uh, test conditions are provided in the IPC test method given. Uh, basically, it's 85 degrees C, 85% humidity, and a 48 volt bias across the test coupon, where you measure the resistance across the cone patterns after 24 hours, 96 hours, and 168 hours. In order to pass this test, you have to be greater than 100 mega ohms of resistance at the 96 and 168 hour checkpoints, uh, and the coupons are specified by the IPC in their B24 coupon. Um, basically, a number of cone patterns with a 20 mil spacing across the, the non-common cones. Uh, there's another test uh, organization called Belcor. Um, this group represents the telecommunications industry. They have their SIR test is 35C, 85% RH, at again 48 uh, volts bias. Uh, you measure SIR after 100 volts without bias and after 94 volts width. And the geometric mean of the SIR needs to be greater than 10 to 11 ohms. So you can see different conditions for pass-fail, um, different uh, times to do the testing, and different environmental conditions for the Belcore test versus the IPC. Uh, now the third, JIS, that's in the Asian standardization body. That test requires 40 degrees C, 93% RH, with no bias across the cone pattern. You measure the SIR after one, four, and seven days again. And there's a requirement, uh, it doesn't come up on the, well on the slide, but the resistance on the coupons, I think, can't be more than a tenth of the original measurement. So theirs is more of a relative test over time rather than a, a checkpoint uh, type of fixed pass-fail criteria. And these are three of the tests that we run. Um, there's a newer test that's much more common now uh, that's been developed within the last, say, five or ten years or so. Uh, really meant to reflect the demands of current, you know, fine feature microelectronic uh, devices, handheld devices, and to also reflect the performance of modern formulations for flux residues and, and flux activators. So this test condition is a little bit different. Um, it's based on the old J standard 004A. However, they've changed the uh, temperature to be 40 degrees C. The humidity is now 90% RH, and the bias level is 12.5 volts per spec. Um, in this test, the SIR um, resistance is now measured every 20 minutes for seven consecutive days, um, which is a big difference between the old uh, check it three times over a week methods. Uh, the pass-fail criteria is the same. Uh, SIR value must be greater than 100 mega ohms and no visible uh, corrosion to be seen. Uh, coupons are the same. Uh, but now there needs to be some automated instrumentation on uh, test detectors attached to the test systems now because of the frequency of measurements. So uh, more robust data comes out of this test than we do with the old test methods. So we're going to show, compare and contrast the old versus new methods. So here's an example of the output for the JSTANDARD 004A test protocol, where you see there's a number of different cone patterns that are measured on there, and we measure the SIR. Uh, every, every at 24 hours one day, four days and seven days, and then a final test at ambient. So we get a relatively limited set of data, but we can see all the data here is above 10 to the eighth, so it passes the requirements. Um, there's also a visual requirement as well to ensure there's no corrosion on the test coupon. With JSTARN 004B, it's a much more robust set of data. Now we can actually graph the SIR performance over time for the entirety of the seven-day test. Um, so this gives us not only just static measurements at different points in time in the test uh, endurance cycle, but it also gives us trends. For example, if the resistance was still falling over time or had increased greatly at one point in time, we could see that and we can make uh, decisions based on that with respect to you know, the reliability of the material. In this case here, to be passing, all of the data has to be above the eight line on that log SIR on the vertical axis, which represents 100 mega ohms. So in this case, we can see that we passed uh, two outliers that were low, but the rest of them at very high values. 
One of the big improvements between the 004A method and 004B is the ability to detect transient dendrites. Um, now, this test was done on a cycling type of environment, but you can see somewhere about midday on day two, there was a drop in the resistance of one of the channels for probably one of the 20-minute measurement intervals. In this case, what had occurred was that a dendrite had grown across two of the adjacent combs, was drawing current across that comb, but because it was a very uh, high amperage draw, it, was, it would tend to destroy the dendrite and open it back up again. So in this case here, very unlikely that the J standard 004A test would have seen it uh, through the automated test measurement systems. Um, it would have still been seen with the visual inspection. However, I think everyone here would agree that visual inspection is not quite as robust as uh, collecting automated data. Um, so an improvement here is that the test resolution is much finer and can detect very small transients that weren't detected under the old static methods. Now, there is also some customer-specific SIR methods. Uh, these are based on the J standard 004B. Uh, it's one particular customer has adopted that but changed some of the conditioning. Um, and it's important to contrast this to what we had before with the regular 004B method. Um, we still have the same 40% – I'm sorry, 40 degrees C, 90% RH. However, there's now a 50-volt DC bias as opposed to 12 volts. We're still measuring SIR every 20 minutes, but now the test duration is 500 hours or 21 days. So it gives you an example of some of the differences in the automotive uh, test because they're looking at test over a 48 volt bus and they're looking at much longer durations before they can uh, gain the required confidence from the test to ensure it'll meet their service environment requirements. Uh, same test uh, pass fail requirements. Uh, however, the coupons are customized again to customize around the requirements of the very specific automotive sector. Uh, electromigration is very similar. Uh, what you have with electromigration is the same kind of conditioning with different, uh, you know, environmental conditions applied. So it's a slightly different coupon. Uh, the spacing has tighter spacing than the B24 in the Belcor test method, which mimics the IPC test method. But the test condition is 65 degrees C, so higher temperature, 10 volt bias, um, and you measure the SIR after 96 hours without bias and after 500 hours with, looking for, again, a relative comparison of the um, before and after resistance to get your pass-fail criteria, in addition to visible test requirements for no visible corrosion allowed. Uh, JIS, theirs is uh, 85C, 85% RH, 50 volts DC. You measure SIR for 1,000 hours, and again, no more than a factor of 10 reduction in the resistance with no visible indication of any electromigration. So again, you have your resistance test, plus you have your visible inspection afterwards for any evidence of corrosion in these types of tests. So with all these different test conditions, this is probably the biggest takeaway of the last 10 minutes of what I just described, is the relative uh, difficulty of passing of these different kinds of tests. So working from left to right, you generally go from easier to more difficult in the SIR test protocol. Um, unfortunately, the double four a test methods are all the way at the far left. Uh, it turns out that that method was appropriate for halide bearing fluxes, typical of RMA formulations from decades ago, but really didn't stress the flux in a way that was uh, representative of its performance with the newer uh, technology that's out in the, uh, in the market nowadays. So as you go left to right, you can see the newer tests, the 004B, the JIS, the automotive custom tests. Those ones are much more difficult to pass, um, and they're the ones that are, that are the focus of manufacturers when they go to develop high reliability flux materials. It's these kinds of tests that end up being the requirements that need to be passed in order to, to meet the needs of the customer market. All right, so this slide here, I'm not going to promise to fully understand what these graphs tell us. Uh, however, what they're trying to show us here is that there is an effect with the coupon design. The closer the track spacing, the more sensitive the test is to detecting low resistance. In addition, the lower the test voltage, the applied test voltage, the, the more sensitive the test is. That's why you see the tests trend now towards tighter spacing and smaller voltages on 
uh, these newer methods that are being developed. All right, now on top of just static tests, there are also some test conditions that we call doing or cyclical temp humidity tests. So these tests are developed by the IEC, so it's an international electronics uh, standard. It's not just automotive specific. However, it's, it's very uniquely posed to test a condition that's commonly seen in the automotive sector. Um, so multiple worldwide manufacturers use this test as one of their standard tests for flux reliability. Uh, these tests can be carried out on full assemblies or coupons. Um, we've adopted the SIR test that we run and these conditions to generate a customized hybrid cyclical test that reflects IPCJ standard SIR test protocols. Um, in many cases, we'll run these tests in combination. These are really meant to, um, per, to generate test conditions that are typically seen by an assembly. So we'll build test coupons in an assembly style format. We'll use solder paste and then cover that with liquid flux and wave solder it. And then we'll hand solder. So we'll have multiple applications of flux. And then in some cases, there'll actually be conformal coating applied to the assembly or the test coupon to reflect the material stack up in the assembly. Um, this test is uniquely um, uh, targeted for that exact combination because not only are you stressing the coupons with humidity and temperature, but you're also cycling that, so you're getting the effect of, of temperature cycles on the adhesion of conformal coatings to assemblies, and then testing the electrical performance of those material stack-ups together. So after all that, let's look at what a doing test is. This slide here shows you do. And this is exactly why the automotive companies like to use this as a test, especially for assemblies like uh, rear view cameras or um, you know, lighting controls that are placed in an area where there can be some condensation on the exterior of the vehicle that could potentially um, you know, get some ingress into the automotive assembly. So these tests um, play with the concept of relative humidity. The idea here is to change both the temperature and the amount of moisture in the air to ensure you don't get condensation, but you have the relative humidity um, as high as it can possibly be without getting that condensation. So in testing the, in running these tests, you both have to cycle humid, uh, the temperature. We've also got to have a way to control the amount of moisture in the air, especially as the test conditions get cooler, because if you don't pull the moisture out, you'll get it the chamber temperature below the dew point, then you'll get condensation and it can ruin the test. So uh, test chamber development and uh, definition is very important. It's really difficult to do apparently. Here's the spec for the doing test. So it shows on the top the relative humidity window that's required. So no lower than 90% on the cool cycles, between 90 and 96% on the cooling cycles. Um, and then on the uh, opposite cycle, you get 95 to 100% humidity. Um, you can spec temperature in as plus 25 to either plus 40 or plus 55, depending on the service environment needed. And a full cycle runs 24 hours. Uh, runs about 12 hours on the high end and 12 hours on the cool end. So um, this is just a readout from a chamber, really trying to show how difficult it is to, to get the chamber tuned properly to meet these conditions. And then here is the SIR output. So unlike the top left, which we saw earlier, which was our static J standard 004B test at static conditions, um, the rest of these all show what happens when you actually cycle the temperature and humidity. Um, temperature and humidity can affect the resistance of materials and the conductivity of, material, of the environment. And so you'll see reflected that in the measurement, you'll see the cycles as they occur. So on the bottom left are control coupons. Those show the effect on just a bare board with no materials attached. The top right shows a good board where you see the cycles, but you see consistent performance. You don't see any of the resistance values dropping too low. Uh, on the bottom right, that is not a good result. What you see here is in many instances, the resistance of multiple channels dropping down below what the graph shows and well below the test limits that are specified. Um, in these cases, these would almost act like intermittent shorts on the circuit under those conditions. So clearly not a passing result for that assembly. There's also a visual test, a visual aspect of this as well. Um, obviously you don't want to see what we see on top right, actual vis visible evidence of dendrites. Uh, on the top left, that's a good indication that although the unit may have passed, 
Um, this would be one where you would tend to want to apply conformal coating as a protective measure. You see some beginning of corrosion uh, due to the high levels of humidity and near condensation. Um, bottom left condition, that's definitely what you want, where you see no effects on the copper comb pattern, even in that environmental uh, test chamber. Uh, there's some other tests. There's one called the Bono test. Uh, this is pretty popular with French companies. Um, this is a test designed to test the corrosive nature of um, solder paste and flux residues on copper. Uh, the idea here is to differentiate at the very low end of the corrosive nature. Um, so there are, there are some companies that specify this test for different materials. Um, what you see here is the anode cathode pattern for the Bono test. Um, I don't know how well it comes across on the screen, but there's a very, very narrow filament that runs through on the anode side, and there are two cathodes that surround it. Um, we'll paste print on the cathodes or we'll apply flux to the cathodes and then we'll apply a voltage and condition. See an example of a before and after with the printing on the cathodes. Um, the math behind this, there's a, a corrosivity factor that's calculated based on the how quickly the uh, anodes are degraded by the exposure to the flux residue in that bias. Um, one of the things we'd like to stress about this test is that we find that we have a lot of variation when we run the test ourselves and our test results. Um, Alpha actually contracts this out to a lab that's got a much more a low variation test process. Um, one of our concerns on this has always been variation in the coupon construction. Um, and so the test lab has farmed out all of their coupon construction to a single test uh, PCB fab site, and that ensures good consistent results with all their tests. When we try to replicate these in our local labs, we find that just the variation from one PCV fab facility to the next uh, is enough to give you a pretty big change in the results here. Um, however, all that said, uh, what you see here is a low value is good. Um, anything below 2% is considered to be within the margin of error of the test measurement. Up to about 8% is considered acceptable per this test. Um, above 8% is where there gets to be a concern about the corrosive nature of that residue. All right, and there are also customer-specific tests. Um, you, you name a customer and they've probably, a big OEM, they've probably got some sort of test in their test scheme somewhere, especially in the automotive side, or any high reliability programs will tend to have tests in their qualification scheme specifically designed to test electrochemical reliability of flux. The most important thing about these tests is that um, they are um, tested with bias present at elevated temperature and humidity levels designed to be a catalyst to dendritic growth or to determine if there's any leakage current occurring across non-common conductors due to the presence of a flux residue. So here's another page full of more test parametrics, more criteria. Uh, now one thing Alpha does is that you know, obviously we do a lot of SIR testing, both in the development phase of our products um, as part of our copy exact process across the world, we manufacture our products, but also as a means to understand the effective combinations of materials. What happens if I take this solder paste and I have this liquid flux and I use this core wire and I use this gel for touch up? Well, we can test them in combination to determine whether or not there's a synergy amongst those materials that could potentially take four different materials that pass SIR, but when used together, maybe don't give you the same uh, excellent results you're expecting. Um, we can also test the combinations of pastes or fluxes and conformal coatings that go over them, especially in the doing or the cyclical temp and humidity tests. Um, so those are great resources, uh, lets us understand from a material selection standpoint, um, which materials give you the highest chances of meeting the service environment needs of the product, um, so that when you go into and finally do get to the point of building assembly test vehicles and qualifying the assembly, you've got high confidence that you're not going to run, run into any problems in the electrical reliability standpoint. Um, we have some material set combinations that have been published uh, and are recommended to be used together. So if you come to your local salesman or uh, you know technical support representative and say, I've got a new product, um, it's got to be halogen free and it's going to be no clean. And I want and it's going to go into an automotive product. Uh, you know, what would you recommend for all of the materials in your material set? 
well, this would be what we would go to and go right to ones that have been tested together already, again, to gain that high confidence that these materials will work very well when they're tested at the assembly level. Okay, so that's flux residue and electrochemical reliability. Uh, mechanical reliability is a separate, unique, and very important topic as well. Um, it really is more about the alloy used, and to some degree, as long as the process is done correctly, uh, you know, the process as well. With mechanical reliability, it is extremely complex. Uh, we could do a full college course on just mechanical reliability of solder joints. Uh, we're going to try to cut that down to 15 or 20 minutes of the most important topics. Um, there is a lot of math and modeling involved in reliability modeling. Um, so we're going to try to focus on some of the basic reliability and mechanical property terms and focus them on the automotive market uh, in their segment because they primarily tend to uh, have a lot of focus on uh, mechanicals of their solder joints as well as the electricals. So let's, first thing we'll talk about is how do solder joints fail, right? So joint fracture can be caused by short-term loading. Uh, you know, any mechanical bond is going to have an ultimate strength that it's going to be able to hold. If you exceed that ultimate strength, you get fracture, tensile fracture of the connection. Uh, a great example of this are uh, large BGAs or passive devices that go on to a depaneling operation in the factory, and while they're being cut out of the panel, they're bent and flexed, and now you've exceeded the strength of the solder joint and you get fractures. That's not the only kind of failure that can occur. Um, these are typically not field type failures. Uh, the next category would be where we have either low cycle or high cycle fatigue, whether it be fatigue caused um, and failure at a low number of cycles or whether it be end of life type failures after a high number of cycles. Um, there's also joint fracture can be caused by creep. So there's under the, the um, conditioning of static mechanical stress, you can get failure over time. Um, however, None of these ever happen by themselves only to a solder joint. Typically, you're going to have a number of different combinations of different kinds of stresses and strains and tensile loading on solder joints at different times for different durations over the course of the life cycle of a solder joint. So real-life joint fracture is typically caused by a combination of creep and fatigue, um, and in many cases caused by the natural thermal cycling that occurs on solder assemblies. Uh, here's an example of a mechanical property. Uh, this is trying to show comparison of SAC-305, your, your standard lead-free alloy, with some high-reliability alloys. Um, in this case, the graph on the left shows you the yield strength, so that's the ultimate strength, the ultimate uh, amount of force applied before these joints failed. Um, on the right-hand side is the tensile strength, which is the, actually, I'm sorry, yield strength is the amount of stress applied before you get deformation. Tensile strength is the amount of stress applied before you get failure. Um, in both these cases, you can see that these, this material family of alloys have much higher yield and tensile strengths, and they're designed for use in service environments such as, say, uh, underhood automotive, where SAC-305 just doesn't have quite the robustness it needs for the service environment. Uh, here's an example of creep. Um, what you see here are some very old, and I'm talking about centuries old, lead pipes. Uh, the pipes running off to the left and to the right between each of those uh, brackets that attached them to the wall ran straight when they were installed. But because of the weight of the, um, the water inside of the pipe over the course of the life of the pipe, it applied creep stress, which caused those pipes to sag. Uh, and the same phenomenon can occur to solder when you're connected to a solder joint. And when it comes to creep, the idea here is that over time, a constant load applied to a uh, specimen uh, and maintaining the constant temperature can produce uh, strain that is cumulative over the life of that particular specimen. And so even though it may not fail immediately, the, the long-term effect of that constant stress can eventually cause deformation and or failure of that specimen. So in a creep test, we're going to measure creep and creep rates um, below those that would occur and that would result in failure. But in a creep rupture test, you get uh, progressive deformation, and these are going to be using loads that are much higher than that would be loaded during a creep test. We're going to try to make the, the device fail in the creep rupture type tests. So we see a creep rupture test here. 
Uh, doesn't look very high tech because it really isn't. You take a known mass across uh, a pre-prepared tensile sample like we see here and hang it from the sample and wait for it to fail. Um, and the creep rupture test is measured in how many hours to failure. In a creep test, you're measuring stress and strain and, and physical deformation. So this test is a lot easier to fail because you just walk away from the chamber and come back after it opens up and you can see how many hours it took to fail. What we see in this graph here is a way to show the data and the differences between, again, SAC-305 and the, the Maxwell family of, of high reliability alloys. Um, what you see is a pretty significant difference in the creep rupture time in hours, so higher bar is better on the left-hand graph. And you also see a higher amount of creep elongation percentage, meaning that it had, uh, it, it elongated more before it ultimately failed. So even after it deformed, it still remained intact for a longer amount of time before it failed. Um, again, showing a, a quantified way to demonstrate that the Maxwell family of alloys provide superior creep properties compared to SAC-305. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that we have tensile, compressive, and shear stresses on, on solders. Um, the ones we typically try to test in solder joints are tensile stresses, where we're pulling the solder apart, or shear stress, where we, where we apply stress um, you know, lateral to the actual connection point. Uh, you know, solder joints tend to be pretty good in compressive stress. That's not really much of a concern, so we don't see a lot of work to quantify that. Uh, here's a graph of some shear and creep data, uh, just trying to show a number of different alloys and their comparative stresses and, and shear rates. But really we need to understand why do we, understand, why do we care about stress, strain, and how it's applied to the circuit board and what kinds is because when we put an assembly into the service environment, we're going to see a lot of, of uh, thermal excursions over the course of time. And all of the materials involved in a print circuit board assembly have different coefficients of thermal expansion. The FR4, the copper for the laminate, the ceramic from the uh, chip resistor, the plastic molding from the quad flat pack, the, um, you know, the, the FR4 base and the, and the injection molding on top of an FR4 base BGA package. All of these are going to have different um, thermal expansion coefficients. So as the temperature changes, each of these expands and contracts at different rates. And that puts stress on the one thing holding it all together, which happen to be the solder joints. So those stresses come from different directions, different orientations, and different amounts, depending on what the different joints are connecting together. So in these cases, we're trying to um, develop fatigue models. This is where a lot of the mathematical work and reliability modeling comes in. A lot of uh, material science and mechanical engineering is involved in determining the right kinds of loads to apply to different solder joints, um, the right amount of cycles to apply, the, the temperatures in those cycles, and the duration of those cycles. Um, what we're trying to do is, is use these models to accelerate the fatigue over the course of the life of, a, of an assembly so that it doesn't take you 10 years and 150,000 miles to show that an automotive assembly is going to work for 10 years or 150,000 miles. So these cycles are time dependent. Um, one of the things they use as well is the Poisson ratio, which is basically the, ra the ratio of elongation to narrowing. And this can give you, um, you know, some quantification of the stress and strain applied at different thermal cycles, different temperatures. And why, why we care is what you see, say, in this um, connecting rod, right? There's different stresses at different areas depending on the kinds of stress that's applied and how much elongation occurs at those locations. So all of this work eventually leads to predictive models for solder joint life. Uh, and so this is where the industry was pretty well established for tin lead. There was a pretty high level of confidence in the predictive models for solder joint life the acceleration factors, the effects of different conditioning on the end result uh, of the test units and the relationship there between that and full service life uh, in hours or cycles or uh, miles or whatever the unit might be. Um, however, we're still gaining a lot of that data in the, in the lead-free world because we're now starting to approach some of the end-of-life 
for some of the initial generation Rojas compliant products, actually end of life and field service. So until that loop is closed, we won't be able to really get a good idea of you know, how well correlated these current models are. Um, one thing we do know is that they've changed. The, um, the stress and strain that's applied to tin lead and lead free to causes failures is different now between the alloys. So there's a lot of work in trying to characterize and, and develop these predictive models for the lead free side as well. So it gives you an idea here, just uh, you know, the fact that you have all of your forces are really vectors, and you know they act in a number of different directions depending on as you apply temperature, how much expansion you get <clears throat> from different materials, and the junction of those two materials. Uh, here's an interesting little graph that takes a little bit to see what it's trying to visualize, but what this graph is trying to show is the effect of the stress that's applied to a test vehicle depending on differences in the levels of temperature at different uh, set points. For example, the blue box here shows you 25 to 45 degrees C, six cycles a day, 10, minute, 10 C per minute ramps, um, and, and a relatively narrow range of stresses that's applied to the assembly. And when you just change from 25 to 55 degrees C, so a 10 degree change in your upper temperature, you can see it's a pretty big expansion of the square there that represents the stresses that are applied during uh, that kind of testing. And then compare that to the red box, which is the 0 to 100 C um, with, with uh, different cycle parameters as far as speed and the up and down direction for temperatures. You can see how you get a much wider range of stress and strains applied to the assembly with the larger difference in the, the hot and cold stages of the thermal cycling. So what this is trying to show you is that it's an exponential increase in the amount of stress that's applied when you get uh, changes in the hot to cold um, uh, cycle on the temperature thermal cycling uh, specifications. Well, here's a Weibull plot. This is the way to graph reliability. In plots like this, the further to the right the line is, the better it is. On this case, they're pretty well overlapping, but what we want to show you here is using the acceleration factors to try to extrapolate out, right? So an acceleration factor is designed to, you know, take some testing done under accelerated fact, um, conditions, a test done very quickly, and determine, you know, what the real-life uh, reliability plot would look like if it was done under normal loading conditions that are seen in the service environment. Just to give you an idea of how wide and varied the different automotive environments can be, this shows, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 different SAE automotive environments. Um, and we've grouped them into essentially um, you know, three different categories. Uh, the green category would be ones where you would have relatively low uh, toughness thermocycling down below 85 degrees C at the high end. You know, the trunk, uh, instrument panel, you know, chassis general, you know, things that aren't really going to be in high-stress environments. Um, the pink category are examples of places where you probably thermocycle up to as high as 125, maybe as high as 150 C. Uh, interior rear shelf, uh, intake manifold, hey, there's a tough place to put electronics. Um, near the exhaust and the chassis where you're going to see higher temperatures, um, you know, inside the firewall. These are all places where you're going to have higher... Uh, reliability requirements, and then uh, much more stressful uh, thermal cycle requirements. And then the bottom category, the purple ones, those are ones where you've, the top end is very high. You know, underhood general, uh, the exhaust manifold, so you can see a wide variety in environments just on an automobile. So each of those different environments gets different test conditions applied to it to represent the actual conditions it needs to endure. You know, something you can put into the trunk, that's just part of the trunk cargo general category, probably isn't going to be, um, you know, give you the right confidence if you're going to put it into an underhood application. So you've got to test and design those tests to reflect the actual service environment of the product. Uh, yeah, hey, here's news to everybody. Things get hot inside the engine of an automobile, right? So, again, you have very high temperatures in the underhood environment. Um, you also have some pretty serious vibration exposure in the underhood environment. Um, in many cases, uh, automotive companies are now testing thermal cycling along with vibration at the same time, 
to try to replicate the combined effect of those two environments. Um, and on top of that, you also have fluid exposure risks as well. So you have limitations on what kind of chemicals you can use and have to protect the assemblies to ensure that you don't have any, um, any kind of exposure to harsh chemicals that could affect the mechanical reliability of the assembly. And again, to show you how many different regimes there are, here's another, what's that, nine different thermal cycle regimes that are shown up there. So again, this is just shows you how wide a variety of different environments exist in the automotive sector. Again, another set of com combinations for different vibration requirements. So thermal cycle and vibration are done to test different conditions, and depending on where you're mounted, you'll have different uh, specs for those as well. Now we do vibration analysis on our own when we're developing and testing alloys. Um, we've got a test vehicle that we use, we call it the SURF, the CERF. Um, we'll test it as soldered, and then we'll test it after a thousand thermal cycles again under vibration. Um, there are a couple different test standards that we use as well, and then different amplitude and frequency ranges for the vibration sweeps. Um, these are all done to uh, you know, put these, these candidate alloys through as many different stressful conditions as possible from a development standpoint, um, just so we can determine whether or not we're going to get an effective increase in the performance of the alloy <clears throat> before we go in and do any more detailed um, you know, applications testing. All right, so a quick summary of, of all of that information that was just released out there. Um, you know, the two kinds of reliability that we really want to focus on. Uh, electrical reliability is generally flux dependent, whether it be the flux and solder paste, liquid wave soldering flux, the flux and core wire, or additional liquid or gel touch-up flux. Uh, the most commonly used standard in North America is the J standard 004B. Um, however, there are also some uh, end vehicle specific tests. There are also uh, tests from other markets, whether it be telecommunications or uh, the Asian market as well that are out there that could be specified. Um, we have a lot of data on SIR testing to different protocols for a wide variety of our materials. Um, there's combination data available for a number of combinations as well. So if you have questions about the materials you're using currently, if you're looking at uh, testing new materials down the road, uh, you can get in touch with your local Alpha sales representative or your Alpha customer tech support uh, engineer. Um, we have access to that data, and we can provide reports to show you the performance of these different fluxes under different SIR tests. Now, for mechanical reliability, you're generally looking at the alloy so it's going to be the alloy in your solder paste. It's going to be the alloy in your solder bath and wave or selective soldering. It's going to be the core wire alloy that you're using. Um, without respect for the flux, the, the primary driving factor for mechanical reliability is going to be the alloy and ensuring you've achieved a proper solder joint. Um, several factors have significant effects. There's the yield strength, the tensile strength, the Poisson's ratio. There's a lot of material science that goes into the actual performance of solder joints in a, a service environment typical for electronic assemblies. Um, there's no single common thermal cycle or vibration standard. So just like the flux side, where there's a number of different SIR tests, uh, you know, asking does this solder pass vibration testing isn't really a proper question because there can be many different kinds of thermal cycle or vibration testing. Um, however, um, there's a lot of data out there for different alloys and their performance in uh, these different tests as well, so that information is available um, from a, an engineering development standpoint. So that was the topic for the day. Again, thank you for spending time to uh, listen to us go through all of that. Um, we definitely appreciate your time and hope the, that you learned something from this, uh, from the time you spent uh, on the webinar with us this afternoon. Very good, Jason. Thank you uh, so much. That's great information. Um, Again, this is Robert Wallace. I'm your host for today's uh, webinar. I'd like to throw it out uh, for any questions that any one of our participants may have. Um, and Dave, I'd, I'd like you, uh, maybe if you could uh, read any questions that might have been typed in during the course of the presentation. Absolutely. Um, I unmuted everyone's phone if they'd like to just talk. Um, I don't have any, any um, text questions yet. Um, if you'd like to send me one, please use the chat room at the bottom of the page. Okay. So we open the floor to questions. Oh, 
Okay, and while we're waiting for questions and maybe those who want to type a question again, let me remind you of a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, you will be getting an email from HISCO uh, with a link to uh, an ebook on related reliability topics that you might find of interest. Again, you're going to be getting in that same email the contact information both for myself, Robert Wallace, and for Jason Fullerton, your presenter today. If you have any questions um, or would like any additional information related to today, today's subject or anything alpha related, um, we would be happy to, to answer any questions or provide you what you, you need. And again, we would encourage you to visit the HISCO website and look at the, uh, the slate of upcoming topics for the balance of the week and, and certainly register for any one of those uh, through Friday that might be of interest to you. So again, um, we'll go ahead and open up for any questions that any one of our attendees may have. Um, I've got one here. Um, has JSTD-004B been adopted more widely by any particular industry outside of automotive? Uh, yes, actually, that's pretty much at this point the standard test for general purpose electronics in North America. Okay. So that it really is all encompassing, um, Jason, is that correct? Well, yeah, the, the idea here is that 004B um, is a better test method for the types of fluxes that are on the market now um, as opposed to the RMA styles that were um, really the ones that 004A was designed to test for. Right. And that's all I see coming in. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, um, we certainly, on behalf of uh, my colleagues at HISCO and Alpha, we would, would like to Thank you for the time that you spent today. Uh, again, if there's any questions at all that you might have, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to either Jason or myself. Um, and again, look for that email that is forthcoming from HISCO with the valuable information and uh, also Jason and I's contact information. So again, thank you for attending. Uh, certainly look forward to uh, maybe you attending one of the, the future webinars coming up this week. And with that, I will say goodbye.